universe, God is spirit. He is greater than matter. Uh, for this reason, uh, that he is not subject to nor governed by the laws of physics or nature. He is the creator of those uh, of nature and uh, those laws that maintain his creation. Now, notice if you will, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 4, the discussion Jesus has with the Samaritan woman at the well. And this is in the context and reference to the temple. Remember what Solomon said, you know, who am I? You know, I, how can I build a house for God? Uh, it, it's not going to be able to contain Him. So it's just a place where we can offer sacrifice to Him. And the woman was asking about where is the place that we ought to worship God? In verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, The hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And there's a lot that is encompassed by that statement, especially when we take it in context with the other scripture. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, it speaks to us of God being invisible. Colossians 1 15, speaking of Jesus Christ when He came in the flesh, who is the image of the invisible God. God is spirit. We cannot see Him, we cannot touch Him. Uh, but He is present. Uh, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4, and see this goes back to Jesus' statement, the Father seeketh, you know, the worshipers of God worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. God is invisible. Uh, he shows us there's no form or likeness that men have ever seen. And so when it goes back to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4, it's about the Ten Commandments. It said, you will not make any image. Because God is spirit. He is greater than the creation. And any image that we have, anything we can see, that we can touch, we can handle as part of the physical creation. And God is greater than that. And so if man tries to make an image of God, he's bringing God down to the level of the creation. And he's no longer the creator, but a part of the creation. That's part of the idea and the thinking behind that verse in God's prohibition. He does not want man to corrupt in his mind uh, his thinking and the truth about God. God is spirit, God is infinite, God is eternal. And he asked the question over in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And it, this is important. Verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto Him? That's, that's a legitimate question. You say, now wait a minute. God is spirit. You saw no likeness of Him. So what would you liken Him to? Verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? See, if you're liking him to something, you're saying he's equal to it. Well, 
What, what is equal to God? There is nothing. I'm the Lord. There's none else. I'm God. There's none like me. Chapter 46 and verse 5. Again, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? Oh, I, I forget the, the jingle, but somebody came up with a slogan, Coke is like God because it does so and so. You know, men try to be cute with these things. And they don't understand the ground that they're treading upon. There is no likeness. There is nothing we can compare Him to or make Him equal to. He is greater than anything that we have any experience with. He is greater than the creation. That's why we see in Romans 1 the Paul writing there is talking about the reprobate mind of man. The wickedness and sinfulness of man. In Romans chapter 1 talks about the creation. In verse 22 he says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. God is spirit. He is incorruptible. And yet they bring him down and make an image. And they say, made like unto corruptible man and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. I mean, it's talking about idolatry. But that idolatry can take many forms. Like I said, you know, these little cute jingles and things. But so to what can you liken God? To do so is to bring Him down, is to make Him equal in some way to some part of His creation. God is not equal to man. He is not like man. Man was created in his image and likeness in a moral sense in, in the, the creation. But God is immutable. Man was mutable. Man is not God. That was part of the lie that Satan tried to uh, uh, spin and he fed to Eve and uh, convinced her to partake of that fruit uh, that God had forbidden. You shall be his gods. Man's not a God. Never will be a God. Number one reason, because He's not the Creator. There's only one Creator, therefore there's only one God. And He is identified by that fact that He is the Creator. This brings God down to the level of His creation. It limits Him. Belittles Him. And we need to keep in, in our minds the, the greatness of God in all these things. Now we talk about God and, and we try to describe Him by His attributes. And there's three attributes that we want to just discuss briefly this evening of God as an infinite God is all wise, all powerful, and ever present. The scriptures speaks of God as being all wise. Romans 16, 27. <coughs> to God, only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. He's the only wise God. He is the all wise God. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.17 Again, now unto the King eternal, 
immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So it's describing to him as the only wise. All wisdom, all knowledge comes from him and is given to us. He is all wise, the only wise. The infinite God is omniscient, as the word we use. If you break it down, look at the, the two words, it's omni, which means all, and science, or knowledge. All, uh, all knowledge, all wisdom belongs to God. He is omniscient. He is the almighty Genesis 17, 1. We see him as he is set forth here in, in the book of Genesis. I need to get a new Bible here. This one's starting to fall apart on me. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abraham was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared uh, to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I am the Almighty God. And, and there's many other uh, verses. Uh, Genesis 35, 11, Job 23, 3, Psalms 91, 1. Uh, time constrains us to try to move on that refer to Him as the Almighty. The infinite God is omnipotent. That is, all-powerful. And in 1 Timothy 6.15 refers to Jesus as the only potentate. You know, men want to claim that term for themselves. Men want to be equal with God. That's one reason I don't believe it's appropriate to use the title reverend. That term is only found one time in the Bible and it's applied to God's name. Holy and reverend is His name. There's nothing holy or reverend about my name. Nothing holy or reverend about me. But holy and reverend is His name. The men like to claim the title of potentate. There's only one potentate. There's only one omnipotent. And that's God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the creator. And we see He's the ever-present. The all-present. Psalm 46.1 Said our God is a is ref, our God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Here it speaks to us of his presence. And in Psalm 139 and verse 7. And it's, it's hard to know where to begin because he begins to describe him. Verse 3, Thou compass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Uh, the psalmist here is talking about, you know, God is present. We see He's a very present help. He's ever present. But He's all present. I mean, throughout. He, he fills the creation. So wherever you may be, anywhere in this God's creation, God is there. And He's everywhere all at the same time. Again, He's not limited by time, but He's everywhere. He's in all places, all the time. Uh, in verse 7, it says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? See, God is spirit. And for the attributes of Him being spirit uh, is that uh, he is ever present. He's all present. Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. 
If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. He's ever present. That's what he's describing here. And we refer to that as omnipresent. The infinite God is omnipresent. Now man is a part of the creation. We understand that. We read there how in Genesis uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, uh, God created man. He formed him of the dust of the earth. He's material. Now man is, a, a, I believe, a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit. He formed him of the dust of the earth. There is the material breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, there is the spirit, and man became a living soul. But man is a part of the creation. Therefore he is subject to and limited by the restraints of time, space, and matter. Man has a beginning and an end. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die, Ecclesiastes says. We're subject to time. We have a beginning. <coughs> we have an end. Man can only be in one place in time and space. Right now, I'm right here. I'm not sitting at my desk over at the parsonage. I'm here. If I want to sit at my desk in the parsonage, I have to physically go there. And when I go there, I'm not here. I mean, that sounds simple, but do you understand what I'm saying? We are subject to and limited to the constraints of the creation of space, time, and matter. And man is subject to the natural laws of creation, the physics, the laws of the physical universe, gravity, and other laws that govern uh, the creation, we are physically subject to those laws. I can't walk through walls. I can't see through walls. And different, there's different things like that. You know, we're subject to and limited by. Therefore, we say man is finite. Creation is finite. Man is finite. We're limited. God is infinite. Man is finite. It is not possible for the finite mind of man to understand or comprehend the infinite God. Can't do it. And there again, you know, the man is try, constantly trying to bring God down and, and understand kind of the thought process behind it and liken Him to something because that we can understand. God is greater than that. Notice Isaiah 55. What God Himself says to us, <coughs> verse 8 and 9, He said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What are you saying? You're finite. I'm infinite. I think differently than you do. I understand more. I know more. My thoughts can encompass the entire creation, the entire universe, and beyond. <laughs> Therefore, my ways are not your ways. They're higher than your ways. However, 
Deuteronomy 29, 29 speaks to us, said the secret things belong to God. The word secret means to hide by covering, to conceal. The invisible things of Him are hidden to our finite eyes and understanding. There's, there's a lot of things. You know, we ask, well, why did God do this? Why did God do that? Because we can't understand. It's beyond our comprehension. God does those things that pleases Him, and they are right. And we need to understand that. There are some things that, especially in this life, we will never understand. As something we need to accept. Man wants to be able to quantify everything. He wants to be able to put a number on it, tag it in some way, measure it in some way, create a box and put it in there. You can't do that with God. <laughs> However, it goes on to say that those things which are revealed... There are some things that He has unveiled, that He has disclosed to us about Himself, about the creation. That's contained in the Scriptures. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. As God breathed. This scripture is God revealing Himself and His ways and His thoughts to us. <coughs> you know, we have a phrase and we use it a lot of times and it's frustrating sometimes to people. But we have it in our vocabulary and in our behavior and actions. Some things are on a need-to-know basis. Now, how many times have you heard that? You know? All the workings of the universe, well, that's above my pay grade. You know? I don't need to know all those things. But what I need to know, God has revealed. He's given it to us in the Scripture. And that's the reason it talks about the Scripture is authoritative. It's profitable. It's beneficial to us uh, to reprove, rebuke, exhort, uh, to uh, teach us and to instruct us how to uh, be righteous in all righteousness. These things that are revealed to us, they belong to us. They are ours. The sad thing is, man has this revelation from God, but he doesn't want to believe it. He'd rather take the word of man, a finite man, fallen, corrupt, sinful man, when it comes and when it pertains to the things of God, Talks about the scoffers over there. The scoffers of this world want to ridicule the very idea of a creator. Second Peter chapter three and verses three through seven. They try to uh, assert and maintain that this material universe is all there is. That it is infinite. And we already pointed out that the first, second laws of thermodynamics insist upon the universe being finite, limited to time, space, and matter. They, they say, see, the, the universe has continued since whatever the beginning, you know, and it's going to keep on. Peter says it's reserved, it's being held until a appointed day in which God's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man. 
But God answers finite man, Romans 9, 20. He said, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Think about that. You know, when we, we take into consideration how small, how finite man is, and in the infinite God that fills the whole creation, the universe, and beyond. And yet we challenge God. That's it. You know, we reply against God. And he goes back to the creation. Shall the thing formed now it's God that has made us and not we ourselves. Psalm 100. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? He made us thus because it pleased God to make us thus. <laughs> and He had a greater understanding than we do. You know, sometimes we... And it can be simple things. It can be little things. Lord, why did you give me blonde hair instead of brown hair? Or the person with brown hair said, well, why did you give me brown hair instead of blonde hair? Why did you give me blue eyes instead of brown eyes? You know, we, we look around, we see somebody that uh, we think is pretty or handsome or whatever the case may be. And because they're different than we are, we think, well, why couldn't I look like that? Well, God made you pretty too. He made you handsome too, just in a different way. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why did you make me like this? Why couldn't I be six foot three? You know? Well, please God, in his infinite wisdom, <laughs> to do the things that he has done, but even more so when it comes to our relationship with him. All the more reason for us to put our complete trust and confidence in God. Not in ourselves, not in man, but in God. Proverbs 3, 5, you know. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Why? Because He knows more than we do. He's able to declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet. He knows more about what's going on than we do. We need to put our trust and confidence in Him. There's no one else. There's no other gods. He is the only Creator. God knows us, and He knows our greatest need. And man's greatest need is salvation and the forgiveness of sin. That's man's greatest need. So, oh, I, I need a million dollars. Well, see, his thoughts are not our thoughts. <laughs> you need wisdom. We need understanding more than we need a million dollars. Or whatever it is that you might think. Back in our text there in Isaiah 55 where he said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My... He said that as a follow-up to talking about salvation. Isaiah 55. Oops. Actually, it's already there. How about that? Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. See, our thoughts, our ways are not pleasing to God. And we try to justify ourselves or, or, or whatever, and God says, You need to turn loose of those things.
So you have sinned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said, let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. This speaks to us about the forgiveness of sins. This is God's remedy for our condition. And who are we to say that's not what we need? God has set forth His plan of salvation for us, and there's no other. Now, why did you make it thus? God chose the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. He doesn't send an angelic host and make them visible. And it pleased God that through the preaching of the gospel, the good news, that Jesus Christ, the Creator Himself, God Himself became flesh and came into this world and He lived among us and He lived and fulfilled the righteousness of the law for us, that that righteousness may be charged to our account because we didn't have it. And then He went to the cross and He died for our sins. He became he who knew no sin became sin for us and suffered in our place. Only the infinite wise God, the holy and righteous God, could have provided a way of salvation, forgiveness of sin, whereby He remains just and holy and at the same time is able to justify the sinner and have mercy and compassion upon the sinner. Man couldn't do it. Would you trust Him, believe Him, the salvation of your soul and for all things, our understanding of the creation, the universe, and science, and history, and geography, and all these things that He reveals to us. This is truth. He reveals those things that we need to know. But there are things about the infinite God that we may never understand comprehend but we're to live by faith let us stand so I'm going to try to cut this short